Chapter One: A Strange Adventure. This is the story of a crime committed against a woman. I, Walter Hartwright, drawing teacher, have asked several people to contribute narratives. Each narrator will describe what he saw with his own eyes, so that the narrative will be as truthful as possible, and the evidence will be presented as in a court of law. One. Walter Hartwright's narrative. One evening in July 1849, I went to see my mother and sister at their house on Hampstead Heath. My Italian friend Pesca was there, and he had good news for me. He had found me a job in Cumberland, in the north of England. Four months teaching drawing to the nieces of Mr. Frederick Fairley of Limeridge House. On the evening before I left for Cumberland, I went to say goodbye to my mother and sister. It was past midnight when I left their house to walk home to my apartment in London. As I stood at the crossroads, I felt someone suddenly touch my arm. I turned around quickly in fear and surprise. There, behind me, stood a woman dressed completely in white. Is this the road to London? She asked. She was young and thin, with a pale, worried face. After a pause, I replied, "Yes. Sorry for not answering you before. I was surprised to see you. The road was empty just a moment ago." She indicated a tree nearby. I hid behind that tree to see what kind of man you were. Don't worry, I've done nothing wrong. But there's been an accident. Will you help me? Certainly. I need to go to London. I have a friend there. Could you help me to get a carriage? As we walked together down the London road, looking for a carriage, she said, "Do you know any aristocrats?" Some, I replied. Surprised by her strange question, why do you ask? Because I hope that there's one you don't know, one who lives in Hampshire.、Uh, what's his name? I can't say his name. It upsets me too much. Tell me the names of the aristocrats you know. I named three gentlemen in whose houses I had taught drawing. You don't know him, she cried with relief. Has this gentleman treated you badly? Is he the reason you're here alone at this hour? I can't talk about it, she said. We left the heath and entered an area of houses. After a while, she asked me if I lived in London. Yes, but tomorrow I'm going to Cumberland for four months. Cumberland, she cried. I was happy there once in a village called Limeridge. A lady called Mrs. Fairley was kind to me, but now she and her husband are both dead. I looked at her in surprise and was about to ask her more, but just then I saw a carriage. I stopped it and asked the driver to take the young woman into London. She got into the carriage, then turned to me and kissed my hand. Thank you, she said. Then the carriage drove off, and the woman in white was gone. I walked on, thinking about this strange adventure. As I passed a policeman, I heard a carriage on the road behind me. The carriage stopped, and the driver spoke to the policeman. "Have you seen a woman dressed in white?" "No, sir." The man gave the policeman a piece of paper. "If you see her, stop her and take her to this address." "Why?" asked the policeman. "What's she done?" She's escaped from my asylum," the man replied, and he drove off. Late the next evening, I arrived at Limbridge House. Mister Fairley and his nieces were already in bed. A servant gave me dinner and showed me to my room. The next morning, I went down to breakfast at nine. The dining room was long, with windows overlooking the sea. A lady was standing by a window at the far end of the room, looking out. She was tall and had a beautiful figure. She turned and walked gracefully towards me. What will her face be like? 
I asked myself as she got nearer. At first I noticed that she was dark, then that she was young, and finally, to my great surprise, that she was rather ugly. She had a large, strong, masculine jaw. Her expression was honest and intelligent, but it had none of the gentleness that is the greatest charm of a woman. Mr. Hartwright, she asked, shaking my hand. I'm Marion Halcombe, one of your new students. I hope you won't be bored here. You'll have no men to talk to. Mr. Fairley never leaves his room. He's an invalid, or so he thinks. This morning I'll be your only company for breakfast, since my sister Laura is in her room with a headache. Your life here will be very quiet. I hope you aren't the kind of person who's unhappy without adventures. Oh no, I replied. I like a quiet life, and recently I had such an adventure that I don't want another one for years. As we ate breakfast side by side like two old friends, I told Miss Halcombe about the woman in white. She listened with interest and looked surprised when I told her the part about Mrs. Fairley. When I had finished, she said. Mrs. Fairley was my mother. She was married twice, once to my father, who was a poor man, and then to Mr. Philip Fairley, who was rich. My sister Laura is the daughter of her second marriage. My mother died, then Mr. Fairley died. His brother Frederick Fairley is Laura's guardian. Laura and I are very different. She's blonde, and I'm dark. She's beautiful. And I'm ugly. She's rich, and I'm poor. But even so, we love each other very much. When my mother came here, she started a school in the village. This woman in white was probably a student there. I wonder who she was. After breakfast, I went to see Mr. Frederick Fairley in his room. He was a weak, lazy hypochondriac. Who considered himself a man of artistic sensibility? I left his room with a feeling of relief and spent the morning looking forward to my meeting with Miss Laura Fairley. That afternoon, I went for a walk with Miss Halcombe. In the garden, we met her sister, Miss Fairley. She was a fair, delicate girl in a simple white dress. She looked at me with kind, honest, and innocent blue eyes. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen, and yet there seemed to be something missing. I did not know what. Laura said, "Miss Halcombe, you have your drawing book with you. You see, Mister Hartwright, she's the perfect student. She can't wait to begin her studies." No, I'm afraid to begin," said Laura gently. "I know my drawings aren't good, and I'm afraid to show them to you." Well," said Miss Halcombe, "I'm sure that Mr. Hartwright will pay us compliments, even if our drawings are horrible." I hope he won't pay me any compliments," said Miss Fairley. "Why not?" I asked. "Because I'll believe everything you say to me," she answered simply. I, a humble drawing teacher with no money, fell in love with the rich and beautiful Miss Laura Fairley as soon as I saw her. That evening after dinner, Miss Fairley went outside to walk in the garden. I started to follow her, but then Miss Halcombe called me, and I returned to the drawing room. Miss Halcombe was holding a letter. Beyond her, through the window, I could see Miss Fairley walking in the moonlight. After the story you told me this morning, I've been reading my mother's old letters," said Miss Halcombe. She wrote this to her second husband. Mr. Philip Fairley, when he was in London on business, listen. There is a new student at the village school, a little girl called Anne Catherick. She has come to Limeridge from Hampshire with her mother for a few weeks. Her mother is a respectable woman, but there is something mysterious about her. As Miss Halcombe read, I watched Miss Fairley walking in the garden. I like little Anne a lot. I noticed that she was slow in her studies, so I asked the doctor to examine her. He says that she'll get better. Her clothes were old, so I gave her some of Laura's white dresses. 
I told her that blonde girls look nice in white. She kissed my hand and said, "I'll always wear white. It'll help me to remember how kind you've been to me." Poor little soul. Miss Halcombe looked up from the letter. The woman in white must be Anne Catherick, she said. Just then, Miss Fairley passed by the window again. Her white dress shone in the moonlight. My heart beat fast. Listen to the last sentences of the letter," said Miss Halcombe. "The other reason I like Anne is that she looks very much like Laura. She isn't as pretty, but her hair, eyes, and figure are exactly like Laura's." I stood up quickly, feeling the same sudden fear I had felt when that hand touched my arm at the lonely crossroads. There stood Miss Fairley, alone outside in the moonlight. Looking exactly like the woman in white, I suddenly realized that the something missing was this: my realization of the disturbing similarity between the fugitive from the asylum and my student at Limeridge House. Chapter Two: The Aristocrat from Hampshire. Two. Walter Hartwright's narrative continued. The days and weeks at Limeridge House passed so quickly. What a happy time that was! I spent every day in the company of two excellent ladies. Marion Halcombe became my good friend, and Laura Fairley was my secret love. The touch of her fingers or the sweet smell of her hair made my heart beat fast. A drawing teacher must spend his life in the company of beautiful women who can never be his. I had always known this, and I had never before felt anything more than a teacher's interest in my students. But with Laura, it was different. One day, when I had been at Limeridge for three months, Miss Halcombe asked me to walk with her in the garden. "I know your secret," she said. "You're in love with my sister. I don't blame you. I feel sorry for you, because your love is hopeless." I know you haven't told Laura that you love her. You've behaved honourably. Take my hand. What I'm about to say will hurt you, but it must be done. Her sudden kindness and sympathy was too much for me. My eyes filled with tears. You must leave Limeridge at once, she said. It's not because you're only a drawing teacher. But because Laura's already engaged to be married, her future husband is coming to stay next Monday. She's never loved him. He was chosen by her father just before he died. Until you came here, Laura was like hundreds of other women who marry without being attracted to their husbands. They learn to love them, if they don't learn to hate them, after they're married. Tell Mister Fairley that your sister's ill and that you must return to London. Go before Sir Percival Glyde arrives. Sir Percival Glyde. Yes, Laura's future husband. He has a large property in Hampshire. Hampshire! I cried. Anne Catherick spoke to me of an aristocrat from Hampshire who'd caused her suffering. But it can't be the same man. I must be going mad. Ever since I saw the similarity between Miss Fairley and the woman in white, I've connected them in my mind. The Lord knows I don't want to do so. I don't want that sad woman to be connected in any way with Miss Fairley. Will you please ask Sir Percival Glyde if he knows Anne Catherick? Miss Halcombe looked surprised. I've never heard anything bad about Sir Percival, she said. But yes. I'll ask our lawyer, Mr. Gilmore, to ask Sir Percival about it. The next day, I return to London. My narrative ends here, at the end of the happiest period in my life. Three, Vincent Gilmore's narrative. I, Vincent Gilmore, am Laura Fairley's lawyer. I arrived at Limeridge House on the second of November. I had dinner with Miss Halcombe. Miss Fairley and Mr. Hartwright, their drawing teacher, they all seemed sad. The next morning, 
Mr. Hartwright left for London. After lunch, Miss Halcombe told me about Mr. Hartwright's adventure on Hampstead Heath and her mother's letter describing Anne Catherick. She explained Mr. Hartwright's concern that Sir Percival Glyde might be the aristocrat the woman in white had talked about. She also showed me an anonymous letter that her sister had received that morning. Dear Miss Fairley, I hear that you are going to marry Sir Percival Glyde. Do not do it. He is an evil man. Please believe me. Your mother was very kind to me, so you and your happiness are important to me. I made a copy of the letter and sent it to Sir Percival's lawyer, asking for an explanation. On Monday, Sir Percival arrived at Limeridge House. He is a charming man of about forty-five years old. He treated Miss Halcombe like an old friend, was polite and friendly to me, and treated Miss Fairley with tenderness and respect. He was obviously concerned about her pale face and sad expression. Miss Fairley seemed to be uncomfortable in his company, and left us soon after dinner. Sir Percival then turned to Miss Halcombe and said, My lawyer sent me the copy of that letter. I'm not surprised that it made you worry, but I can explain everything. His manner was open and honest. He told us that Mrs. Catherick, Anne's mother, had been a servant in his family for many years before leaving to get married. Years later, Sir Percival heard that her husband had abandoned her and her daughter was mentally disturbed. He wanted to do something to help the poor woman. Mrs. Catherick told him that she wanted to put Anne in a private asylum, but she did not have enough money. Sir Percival offered to pay. Years later, when Anne discovered this, she considered him responsible and developed a passionate hatred for him. This explanation seemed satisfactory to me, but Miss Halcombe still looked concerned. Please, Miss Halcombe, said Sir Percival, write to Mrs. Catherick and ask her to confirm my explanation. Miss Halcombe wrote a brief letter. Sir Percival wrote the address on the envelope, and a servant posted it. Two days later, Miss Halcombe received a reply. Madam, my daughter was put into a private asylum with my knowledge and approval. Sir Percival Glyde very kindly paid for the asylum, and I thank him for that. Yours truly, Jane Catherick, Anne's mother. On my last day at Limeridge House, I talked to Miss Fairley, explaining the details of her father's will. Next March, on your twenty-first birthday, you'll inherit thirty thousand pounds. If you die before your Aunt Eleanor, Madame Fosco, she'll inherit ten thousand pounds of that money. You must now write a will saying who you wish to leave the other twenty thousand pounds to when you die. Can I leave it to Marion? asked Miss Fairley. All of it. Is there no one else you wish to include in your will? Yes, there is someone, she said in a trembling voice, and she burst into tears. Don't cry, my dear, I said. We'll discuss the details another time, when you're feeling better. I returned to London and wrote Laura Fairley's marriage settlement. Her father had been my good friend, and his daughter was like a daughter to me. I wanted to make the best marriage settlement I could in order to protect her interests. If Laura Fairley dies, I wrote, the twenty thousand pounds will be left according to her will. That evening, I sent the settlement to Sir Percival's lawyer. The next day, it was returned to me. In the margin, by my statement about the twenty thousand pounds, the lawyer had written, No, if Laura fairly dies, Sir Percival will inherit the twenty thousand pounds. I knew that Sir Percival had many debts. This worried me, so I wrote to Mr. Frederick Fairley and explained the situation. I told him not to sign the settlement unless the part about the twenty thousand pounds remained as I had first written it. The next day, I received his reply. My dear Gilmore, I am too ill to argue with Sir Percival. Please agree to whatever changes he wants to make in the marriage settlement. Yours truly, Frederick Fairley. This letter made me very angry. 
The man was too lazy to look after the interests of his own niece. I went to Limeridge the next day and told him that no one should sign a marriage settlement like this. It gave the husband a large financial interest in the death of his wife. But Mr. Fairley did not want to listen. He closed his eyes and asked me to leave him in peace. Chapter 3 Blackwater Park 4. Marion Halcombe's Narrative Extracts from her diary Limeridge House, Cumberland, 8th of November The date of the wedding is the 22nd of December of this year. The married couple will go to Italy for the winter months. When they return, with Sir Percival's friend, Count Fosco, and his wife, Laura's aunt, Eleanor, I will go to live with them in Hampshire. Laura asked Sir Percival if I could, and he very kindly agreed. Sir Percival has noticed that Laura seems unhappy in his company. This morning he spoke to me, and this afternoon I told Laura what he had said. He was very generous. He said that if you want to break your engagement, you can. I can never break my engagement, said Laura. It was my father's dying wish that I marry Sir Percival. But I can tell him that I love someone else. Then perhaps he'll break the engagement himself. Suddenly she seemed the stronger sister. She would not change her mind. After dinner, Laura explained to Sir Percival that she loved someone else. She told him he was free to break the engagement. After what you've just said, I want to marry you more than ever, said Sir Percival. You've been so honest that I value you even more than I did before. Laura's eyes filled with tears. If you insist on our marriage, I'll be your faithful wife, she said, but I'll never love you. I'll be satisfied with that, he said gently, and left the room. After he had gone, Laura gave me a book of drawings that Mr. Hartwright had given her. Marion, you must keep it now, she said. If I die, please tell Walter that I loved him. Then she put her head on my shoulder and burst into tears. Sir Percival is a good-looking, charming and friendly man. His actions towards Anne Catherick and her mother have been generous. I cannot even blame him for not breaking his engagement this evening. Sir Percival is certainly an admirable man, and yet, in three words, I hate him. 28th of November Our dear friend Walter has gone to Central America. He wrote to me, asking me to use my contacts to find him a job in a distant country. I knew of a scientific expedition to Honduras. They needed someone to draw the plants and animals they found there. I recommended Walter, and now he has gone. 22nd of December They are married. My dear sister has gone. I'm crying so much I cannot write any more. Six months later. Blackwater Park, Hampshire, 15th of June, 1850. Six lonely months have passed, and I am with dear Laura once more. But we now live at Blackwater Park, Sir Percival's house in Hampshire. It is a big old house, surrounded by trees. I find it dark and depressing. I arrived here a few days ago. Sir Percival, Laura, Count Fosco and Madame Fosco arrived yesterday. Laura has changed in the last six months. I noticed it in her letters, and now I see it in her face. That honest, open look has gone. There are things now that she will not discuss with me. Her husband, her married life... But before we kept no secrets from each other. Sir Percival has changed too. At Limeridge he was always friendly. But when he saw me yesterday he was cold. His manner towards Laura has changed. He does not look at her with tender interest anymore. 
Madame Fosco is different from the Eleanor Fairley I once knew. Eleanor Fairley was an irritating woman who talked too much and wore expensive clothes. Now she dresses very simply and sits silently, rolling cigarettes for her husband. And her husband? What can I say of Count Fosco? He has certainly tamed his wife, and he looks like a man who could tame a tiger. He interests and attracts me. He forces me to like him. He is enormously fat, and his face looks like Napoleon's. He has intelligent grey eyes. When I look into them, I feel things that I do not want to feel. He speaks English fluently with no accent. He tells me that he left Italy a long time ago for political reasons. The Count has been Sir Percival's friend for years. They first met in Rome. Percival was attacked by thieves, and Count Fosco saved his life. The Count's influence over Percival is much stronger than Laura's. I have never before met a man like Count Fosco. I am very glad he is not my enemy. But is this because I like him, or because I am afraid of him? Sixteenth of June. This morning, Sir Percival's lawyer came to see him. As I was walking to my room, I heard them talking. Don't worry," said the lawyer. "If your wife signs the document, everything will be all right. If not, of course she'll sign the document," said Sir Percival angrily. I went to Laura's room and told her what I had heard. I know that Percival has debts," she said. "But I won't sign anything without reading it first. After lunch, Sir Percival said, "Will you sign this, Laura? It's just a formality. Miss Halcombe and Count Fosco, will you be our witnesses?" He folded the document and placed it on the desk with his hand resting on the folded part. The only part of the document that was visible was the line for her signature. And the lines for the signatures of the two witnesses. Sign your name here," he said. "What is the document about?" asked Laura. "I've no time to explain," said Sir Percival. "A carriage is waiting for me outside. I have to go away on urgent business. Come on, sign it." "I can't sign it unless I've read it. Mr. Gilmore always asked me to read documents before I signed them." "Gilmore was your servant. I'm your husband." Don't you trust me? cried Sir Percival angrily. It's not fair to say I don't trust you," said Laura. "Ask Marion if she thinks I should read the document first. It's none of Miss Halcombe's business," said Sir Percival. "Excuse me," I said, "but as a witness to the signature, it is my business. Laura's objection seems to be fair to me. I can't be a witness unless Laura understands what she's signing." What disrespect! cried Sir Percival. You're just a guest in this house. I wanted to hit him, but I was only a woman, and I loved his wife so dearly. Percival said the Count. Remember, you are in the company of ladies. They looked at each other, and Sir Percival was the first to look away. Those cool grey eyes had tamed him. I don't want to offend anybody," he said. "Just sign the document, will you?" "I'll happily sign when I know what's in it," said Laura. "I'll make any sacrifice so long as it's honest. I simply think it's wrong to sign a document I haven't read." "Who said anything about sacrifice?" cried Sir Percival, furious again. "And it's strange to hear you talk of right and wrong. A woman who had a passion for a drawing teacher." Laura looked at him coldly, then turned her back on him. When I left my chair to go to her, I heard the Count whisper to Sir Percival, "You idiot!" Laura walked towards the door, and I followed her.、Uh, "One moment," said the Count. Laura continued walking, but I whispered to her, "Stop! Don't make an enemy of the Count." We stopped and waited.、And、Percival. Said the count. Can it be signed tomorrow? Yes, I suppose it can. Then let's wait until tomorrow. All right, said Sir Percival. 
he left the room, went straight to his carriage, and drove away. Chapter Five: A Death. Six. Marion Halcombe's narrative continued. Twentieth of June. Laura and I have no father or brother to protect us. Our dearest friend Walter is in Central America, where no letter can reach him. Mr. Gilmore is ill and is staying with relatives in Germany. Our uncle Frederick Fairley is a lazy hypochondriac, but he is also our only hope. This afternoon, I wrote him a letter asking if we could return to Limeridge House. After dinner, Percival said to the Count, "I want to talk to you in private." The Count replied, "Later, when the ladies are asleep." I said that I had a headache and went up to my room earlier than usual. I thought to myself, "I must hear their conversation." I took off my dress and put on a simple cloak. I climbed out of the window and moved along a narrow ledge to the library roof, where I sat down. There, I could hear the voices of Sir Percival and the Count through the open windows. Percival, we are now at a financial crisis," said the Count. "I owe hundreds of pounds. You owe thousands. We must find the money to pay those debts. Recently, you've acted very foolishly. Can't you see that Miss Halcombe has more intelligence than most men? She is a noble creature." Full of strength and courage, and she will use it all to protect that foolish little wife of yours. Now, explain to me about your wife's money. Sir Percival said, "It's very simple. While my wife lives, I get three thousand pounds a year, but that's not enough to pay my debts." And if she dies, asked the Count, "If she dies without children, I'll get twenty thousand pounds." Ah," said the count. "The rain has come at last." He was right. Up on the roof, I was getting wet, but I had to hear their conversation to the end. "Do you love your wife, Percival?" asked the count. "What a question! If she dies, you get twenty thousand pounds." "Yes, and your wife gets ten thousand pounds," cried Sir Percival. "Don't forget that." Anyway, the money isn't my only problem. I have a secret. Don't tell me the secret. Just tell me who knows it. My wife knows it, and a drawing teacher called Walter Hartwright knows it. I know that Hartwright's left the country. He's in love with my wife, and she loves him too. Anyway, the important thing is that they know the secret. Anne Catherick knows it, and she hates me. I'm sure she told them. I've tried to find her, but I can't. What does she look like? Asked the count. I saw a woman by the lake, but I only saw her from behind. She looks like my wife. She's not as pretty, and she's very ill. But still, she looks very similar. Really? Said the count in surprise. He then smiled to himself and laughed. <laughs> Don't worry, Percival. You'll pay your debts. And you'll find Anne Catherick, I promise. Good night. Up on the roof, I was cold and wet. I moved slowly along the ledge to my bedroom window and climbed back in. I changed into dry clothes, lit a candle, and wrote down the conversation. But now I am ill. I have a fever. I cannot get ill now when Laura needs me more than ever. Note: Here the diary becomes impossible to read. On the next page, another entry appears, but it is in a man's handwriting. Postscript by a sincere friend. The illness of the excellent Miss Halcombe has given me the opportunity to read this interesting diary. There are hundreds of pages here, and I have read them all with pleasure. I admire Marion greatly. Her intellect, graceful style, and courage. The description of my own character is brilliant. I am sorry that our interests are opposed, and even though they are opposed, 
and even though I will be victorious, I want Miss Halcombe to know how much I admire her diary, and that nothing in it contributed to my victory and her failure. Fosco. 7. Eliza Mickelson's Narrative I am the housekeeper at Blackwater Park, and I took care of Miss Halcombe when she was ill. During that time, Lady Glyde was so worried about her sister that she herself became ill and stayed in her room. One day, Sir Percival called me into his study and said, I plan to leave Blackwater Park. As soon as Miss Halcombe and my wife are well enough, they'll go to stay with their uncle in Cumberland. Count Fosco and the Countess will soon go to their new house in London, and I'll go to Paris. Send away all the servants tomorrow. You'll stay to manage the house while I'm away. The Count spent his days by the lake. I have no idea why. The next day, when the Count returned from the lake, I heard Sir Percival ask him, Did you find her? The Count did not reply, but he smiled. The next day was my day off. When I returned, Sir Percival told me that Count Fosco and the Countess had left for London. I then went to Lady Glyde's room to see how she was. She was still weak and depressed, and she asked me to take her to her sister's room. As we walked along the corridor, Sir Percival came up the stairs and said, She's not there. She went to London with Count Fosco and the Countess. Then she'll go to your uncle in Cumberland. That's impossible cried Lady Glyde. She didn't tell me she was going or say goodbye. I must go to her immediately. You must wait till tomorrow, said Sir Percival. I'll write to Fosco. He'll meet you at the station and take you to his house. Lady Glyde began to shake. I don't want to sleep in London, she said. You must. The journey from here to Cumberland is too long to do in one day. Lady Glyde was ready to leave the next morning. I took her to the station. When we got there, she suddenly seemed frightened. I don't want to go alone, she said. You've been very kind to my sister and me. Thank you. She looked so lonely as she said those words that my eyes filled with tears. Goodbye, my lady, I called as the train moved off. When I returned to Blackwater Park, Sir Percival said to me, Go and see if Miss Halcombe is all right. She's in the guest room on the second floor. Miss Halcombe? I cried. Yes, said Sir Percival. I had to lie to Lady Glyde. You heard the doctor say that she needed fresh air. The only way to make her go to Cumberland was to tell her that her sister had already gone. It was done with the best of intentions. Sir Percival, I said firmly, I can't work here any more. I'll stay until Miss Halcombe is well enough to leave, but then I must go. That night Sir Percival left Blackwater Park. I never saw him again, and I hope I never will. 8. The Cook's Narrative I am the cook at Count Fosco's house in London. When the Count and Countess arrived from the countryside, they brought a guest with them, the Countess's niece, Lady Glyde. She was a pretty blonde lady with blue eyes, but she looked very weak. The day she arrived, she became very ill, Dr. Goodrick examined her and said, This is a serious case of heart disease. Lady Glyde won't live much longer. The next day she died. Dr. Goodrick registered the death and my mistress made all the arrangements for the funeral. The dead lady's husband was out of the country, so my mistress arranged for the lady to be buried in her hometown in Cumberland, in the same grave as her mother. In conclusion, I'll answer two questions that Mr. Hartwright asked me. One, I never saw Count Fosco give Lady Glyde any medicine. Two, he was never alone in the room with her. Nine, the doctor's narrative. I certify that Lady Glyde, aged 21, died on the 25th of July, 1850, at 5 Forest Road, London. The cause of death was heart disease. Signed, Dr. Alfred Goodrick. 10. The Gravestones Narrative 
Here lies Laura, Lady Glyde, wife of Sir Percival Glyde, born 27th of March, 1829, married 22nd of December, 1849, died 25th of July, 1850. Chapter 6 Sir Percival's Secret 11. Walter Hartwright's Narrative On the 13th of October, 1850, I returned to England. I still loved Laura, but I knew I had to live without her. First I went to my mother's house. When she met me, she told me, very gently, that my love was dead. In the deepest misery I went to Limeridge to see her grave. The countryside and the sea reminded me of the happy months we had spent together. I went to Mrs. Fairley's grave. There was a new inscription written on it. Here lies Laura, Lady Glyde. In the near distance I saw two women with veils over their faces. When they saw me, one lifted up her veil. It was Miss Halcombe, her face sadly changed by suffering and sadness. The other woman walked towards me. I looked at her closely. She stopped in front of me and lifted up her veil. Standing before me, beside her own grave, was Laura, Lady Glyde. I cannot describe my feelings of shock and joy at that moment. Miss Halcombe said, Walter, we must all go to London immediately. We're probably being followed. On the train, Miss Halcombe told me everything that had happened since she last wrote to me. When I woke up from my illness, she said, I found myself in a strange room. Mrs. Mickelson told me that Laura had gone to London, where she'd become ill and died. This terrible news made me ill again, and I was unable to leave that house for another three weeks. I then went to London to see Mr. Gilmore's partner, Mr. Curl. I told him I was suspicious about the circumstances of Laura's death. Mr. Curl investigated and told me that he saw nothing suspicious. I then went to Limeridge and saw my uncle. He told me that Count Fosco had accompanied the body from London and had gone to the funeral, which my uncle himself had been too ill to go to. The Count had left a letter for my uncle, telling him that Anne Catherick was back in the asylum, but she now believed that she was Lady Glyde. I left Limeridge and went to the asylum. I explained who I was and asked to see Anne. Imagine my feelings, Walter, when I saw my dear sister there in the asylum and that everyone believed she was Anne Catherick. I gave the nurse £100 to help Laura escape. We came to Limeridge and explained everything to my uncle, but he said that I was a fool. He doesn't recognise his own niece. He's sure that she's Anne Catherick. Laura had certainly changed. Her face was pale and thin, and her long suffering in the asylum had affected her mind, so that her expression was vague and her memory confused. Now the similarity between Laura and Anne Catherick was stronger than ever. Because of our great love for her, Miss Halcombe and I had recognised her immediately, but the Count's letter had influenced Mr. Fairley and even the servants at Limeridge House had not recognised her. I found two apartments in the same house in London. I took one, using a false name, and Marion and Laura lived in the other under the same name. I said they were my sisters. I spent my days drawing and selling my work at nearby shops. Marion cooked and cleaned for us. My one hope now was to prove Laura's identity but Mr. Curl, having heard the whole story, said that it would be impossible. When I left his office, he gave me a letter to give to Marion. In the street, I noticed two men following me. I got in a cab and escaped from them. At home, I gave the letter to Marion. It was from Count Fosco. This was the letter. I write, magnificent Marion 
to console you. Fear nothing. No one will follow you or your lovely companion if you leave us in peace. If Mr. Hartwright returns to England, do not contact him. Be happy, dear lady, with what you have. F. The only signature was an F at the bottom of the page. Marion, I said, we must bring them to justice. We must give Laura back her true identity. Mr. Curl says we can't prove that she is Lady Glyde, so we must force one of them to confess it. The Count has no weak point that we know of, but Sir Percival does. The secret! cried Marion. But we don't know it. Anne's mother, Mrs. Catherick, knows it, I said, and I'll find out what it is. Then I can use the secret to force Sir Percival to tell the truth about Laura. The next day I went to Mrs. Catherick's house in the village by Blackwater Park. Mrs. Catherick was a hard-looking woman dressed in black. Say what you've come to say and then leave, she said in a cold, aggressive voice. I've come to tell you that your daughter is dead. How do you know? she asked indifferently. I can't tell you, but it's true, I said. Sir Percival Glyde was involved in your daughter's death and has committed a crime against someone I love. I know that he's your enemy as well as mine. I know that you know his secret. Tell me his secret and we'll both get our revenge. He has used you. He, a rich man from an aristocratic family. Oh, yes, she cried sarcastically. Her very aristocratic family, especially on his mother's side. She stopped speaking suddenly, as if she had said something she did not mean to say. So, Sir Percival's secret was something to do with his mother. Mrs. Catherick said no more. When I left her house, I saw two men following me, but I did not care. I went to the village church and spoke to the parish clerk. Please can I see the register of marriages in this church for the years just before 1804, I asked. I followed the parish clerk into the vestry, a small building attached to the church. The room was full of old papers. The parish clerk took a register from a shelf. Those registers are full of important documents, I said. Surely they should be kept more safely. That's just what the old parish clerk said the man replied. Not the one before me. His name was Catherick, but the one before him. He was so concerned about the registers that he kept copies of them locked up at his home, in case anything happened to the originals. Every day he copied down the births, marriages and deaths recorded that day. Here's the register for 1804 and the one for 1803, sir. Did you say that the parish clerk before you was called Catherick? I asked in surprise. Yes, sir. Well, I'll leave you to look at the registers. I found the record of the marriage of Percival's father, Sir Felix Glyde, to Cecilia Elster in September 1803. It was written in a very small space at the bottom of the page. The entry above, recording the marriage of a man called Walter, took much more space. The entry on the next page also took a lot of space, recording a double marriage. I wondered why so little space had been given to the record of Sir Felix's marriage. But apart from that, there was nothing unusual about it. I was disappointed. As the parish clerk put the register back on its shelf, I said, You spoke of old copies of the register. Is there a copy of the records of 1803? I think so. Can I see it? Well, I suppose you can. The old parish clerk is dead now, but his son lives in the village. He probably still has the copies. I went to the house of the old parish clerk's son and asked if I could see his father's copy of the register for 1803. He let me in and brought me the heavy book. I found the record of the marriage of the man called Walter but the space at the bottom of the page was empty. On the next page was the record of the double marriage. The copy had no record of Percival's father's marriage. 
I realized that the record in the original register must be a forgery added in years afterwards. The truth was that Percival's father had never married Percival's mother. I knew I had to get the original. It was not safe in the vestry, and it was the only evidence of Sir Percival Glyde's secret that he has no right to his title and his property. As I ran back towards the church, I saw flames against the evening sky. The vestry was on fire. I heard the sound of a man crying for help. A crowd of people had gathered. Someone's inside, I cried. Who is it? A man close to me said, It's my master, Sir Percival Glyde. For a long time I had felt nothing but hatred for Sir Percival, but I could not watch as he burnt to death in the vestry. I saw a window on the roof. Quickly I climbed onto the wall beside the vestry, then onto the roof. Perhaps he could escape through the window. I broke the glass, but then the flames jumped out of the open space. Just then the fire engine arrived. Firemen broke down the door and went in. They came out carrying the dead body of Sir Percival Glyde. Chapter 7 Mrs. Catherick's Story 12. Walter Hartwright's Narrative Continued at the inquest the next day, the parish clerk said that the key to the vestry had gone missing just before the fire. Perhaps somebody had stolen it. Nobody could understand why Sir Percival had been in the vestry. The inquest concluded that Sir Percival's death was an accident. He had probably taken a candle with him into the vestry, because by then it was dark. The vestry was full of dry papers. Somehow they had caught fire and Sir Percival could not get to the door. I did not tell them what I knew. I had no proof now of the forgery in the register, because the register was burnt. Feeling depressed, I returned to my hotel. There I found two letters for me. One was from Marion. Dear Walter, please return to London. We have moved to a new house. Do not worry, we are safe, but come back quickly. Our new address is Five Gowers Walk. Your friend, Marion. I put the other letter in my pocket and ran to the station to get the first train to London. On the train I opened the other letter. It was from Mrs. Catherick. 13. Mrs. Jane Catherick's Narrative Sir, I have heard the news of a certain gentleman's death. I also heard that you were foolish enough to try to save him. Even so, your investigations were the cause of his death, and I thank you for that. To show you how thankful I am, I will tell you what you want to know, that gentleman's secret and mine. I will not sign this letter, and I will not name the gentleman in question. Let's just call him Sir P. Twenty-three years ago, Sir P. admired me, I was married to a parish clerk who was a fool with no money. Before I married him, I had worked for Major Donthorne of Varnick Hall, and I had seen how rich ladies lived. I liked beautiful things, and Sir P. gave me beautiful presents. What did he want in exchange for the presents? Only the key to the vestry. I gave it to him. My daughter Anne was born three months later. My foolish husband found the presents hidden in my room. He told everyone in the village that Sir P had been my lover, and that Anne was Sir P's child. Then he left me. He was wrong, of course. I had only known Sir P for four months. I went to Sir P and asked him to tell the villagers that my husband was wrong. He laughed at me. He then told me what he had done to the register and he explained what the law does to people who commit that crime. By giving me the key to the vestry, you became my partner in the forgery, he said. If the police find out, they'll put you in prison for years. Then he said, You've been very helpful to me, so now I'll help you. I'll send you money every month on two conditions. You must keep the secret and never tell anyone. 
in your own interest as well as mine, and you must never leave the village. He knew that none of the village women spoke to me because they thought I had lost my virtue. He knew his secret was now safe, so he explained it all to me. His mother was already married when his father, Sir F, met her. She had married in Ireland, but returned to her parents in Hampshire when her husband treated her badly. No one in Hampshire knew anything about her marriage, so when Sir F said that he had married her, no one suspected anything. Sir F told Sir P the truth when he was dying. As soon as Sir F was dead, Sir P claimed the title. Blackwater Park and the land. No one suspected that he wasn't the legitimate heir, but then he got into debt, and in order to borrow money, he had to show a birth certificate and a certificate of his parents' marriage. That is when he came to me. How I hated him! He forced me to stay here in this village, where they all talked about me, but no one spoke to me. Finally, now after all these years. I have earned their respect. The vicar says hello to me, but back then, when Anne was a child, my life was very hard. Sir P sometimes let me go away for a short while. He let me go to Limeridge for a few weeks once. Mrs Fairley of Limeridge House liked Anne. That made me laugh. Mrs Fairley was a foolish, ugly woman who had somehow managed to marry one of the most handsome men in England. Another time, I wrote to Sir P to ask if I could go away for a few weeks. His reply was very rude. As I read it, I became so angry that I insulted him out loud in front of Anne. I said he was a miserable impostor. The next day, he came to my house to say that he had changed his mind. Anne was in the room, and he told her to leave rather rudely. Anne turned to him and said. You're a miserable impostor. She had no idea what it meant. She was just repeating my words. But Sir P was terrified. He was sure that she knew his secret, so he put her in the asylum. I did not object. I have never loved my daughter. Fourteen. Walter Hartwright's narrative. When I got to our new house, Marion and Laura were waiting for me. Marion had told Laura that we had moved to a new house because it was in a nicer part of London. When Laura had gone to bed, I asked Marion, "What's the real reason?" "Count Fosco," said Marion. "Yesterday, I looked out of the window in our old house, and I saw the count standing outside with the doctor from the asylum. Then they went away. Later, the count came back alone. When I saw him." I told Laura that I was going for a walk, and went out to him. He said he'd come for two reasons: first, to express his feelings for me, I refused to listen to them; and secondly, to repeat the warning in his letter. He told me that Percival was dead, and that you were investigating Percival's secret when he died. The Count had contacted the asylum doctor and said he knew where Anne Catherick was. But when he and the doctor were outside the house, the count changed his mind and sent the doctor away, saying that he'd been mistaken. Why? It's embarrassing, Walter, but I must tell you. He changed his mind because of me. The one weak point in that man's iron character is the admiration he feels for me. He said, "Tell Mister Hartwright to stay away from me." If I must put your pretty sister back in the asylum to stop Mr. Hartwright from investigating me, I shall do so. But I prefer not to, because I don't want to cause you pain, Miss Halcombe. As soon as he left, I decided to take this new house. The next day, we told Laura that her husband was dead, and that her marriage, the greatest error of her life, was over. Chapter Eight, A Night at the Opera. Fifteen, Walter Hartwright's narrative continued.
We lived quietly in our new house. Laura was getting better. Now she looked like the Laura I first met at Limeridge. Her expression was lively once more. She smiled frequently, and she had lost that sad, nervous look that made her so very like Anne Catherick. The only thing that had not improved was her memory of the period between her departure from Blackwater Park and her escape from the asylum. She remembered nothing of that painful time. Mr. Curl told us that if she could not remember what had happened to her, we had no hope of proving her identity. During that time, I thought often of Anne Catherick. Some parts of her mother's letter were of particular interest. I had certain suspicions, so I wrote a letter to Mrs. Catherick's old employer, Major Donthorn of Varnick Hall. I asked him some questions about the time when Anne Catherick's mother had worked at his house. This is the reply I received. Dear Mr. Hartwright, in answer to your questions, I never met Sir Percival Glyde, and he certainly never came to Varnick Hall. Mr. Philip Fairley, however, was a frequent visitor here, and yes, he was here in September 1826. I hope this helps your investigations. Yours truly, Major Donthorne. Anne was born in June 1827. She was very like Laura, and Laura was very like her father. The conclusion was obvious. I thought of those famous words from the Bible. The sins of the fathers would be visited upon the children. The fatal similarity between two daughters of one father had caused all this suffering. I thought also about Laura's meeting with Anne Catherick by the lake. Anne had said that she wanted to die and to be buried beside Mrs. Fairley. A little more than a year had passed since she had said that, and now her wish had come true. The mystery of the woman in white had finally been solved. I could now say goodbye to the ghostly figure who has haunted these pages as she haunted my life. April came, the month of spring, and things were beginning to change between Laura and me. Throughout her long illness, I had been like a brother to her. Now that she was better, my heart began to beat fast again when she was near me. Our hands began to shake when they met. One day I spoke to Marion. You know that I've loved Laura since the day we met. I want to protect her and fight for her interests with all my strength. I want to marry her so that I'll have the right to protect her. What do you think? I agree, said Marion, kissing me on the forehead. I'll go and speak to her now. She ran out of the room and I waited, trembling. After a few minutes, Laura ran into the room and threw her arms around my neck. My darling, she whispered. Can we say that we love each other now? Ten days later, we were even happier. We were married. At the beginning of May, I began watching the Count's house. One evening, he got into a cab and told the driver to go to the opera house. I took a cab to my friend Pesca's house and asked him to come to the opera with me. I knew that Pesca had left Italy for political reasons. I also knew that the Count had left Italy many years ago. Perhaps Pesca knew the Count. Perhaps the Count really was a spy a spy in a much more important sense than Laura had intended when she called him by that name. At the opera, I asked Pesca, Do you recognize that fat man over there? I noticed that a man close to us was listening with interest to our conversation. He was a thin, blonde man with a scar on his cheek. No, Pesca replied. I've never seen him before. Just then the Count looked up and saw Pesca. The Count's face, which had been happy a few seconds before, was suddenly full of fear. He stood up and quickly left the theatre. We tried to follow him, but the corridors were crowded. I noticed that the man with a scar on his cheek ran through the crowd and followed Fosco out of the theatre. We went to Pesca's apartment. My dear friend, I said, I know you left Italy for political reasons. 
You told me long ago that you couldn't explain them to me, but this is an emergency. Please help me if you can. You say you don't recognize that man, but he recognizes you, and he's afraid of you. Can you explain why? Pesca got up and walked around the room nervously. After a few minutes of intense thought, he sat down again and said, "What I'm going to tell you now is a secret, and I could be killed for telling it to you. When I was young, I joined a secret political association in Italy, called the Brotherhood. The aim of the Brotherhood is to stop the abuse of power and to maintain the rights of the people. Members murder people who abuse their power." Anyone who joins the Brotherhood must stay in it for his lifetime. Anyone who betrays the Brotherhood will be killed by another member. When I was young, I had passionate political beliefs. Now I'm older, I want to leave the Brotherhood, but I can't. That's why I left Italy and came to live in England as a teacher. Here, I'm of no use to the Brotherhood. Each member of the Brotherhood has a scar like this one on his arm. Pesca rolled up his sleeve and showed me a small red scar. I was a leader before I left Italy. This man recognizes me, but I don't recognize him. I haven't changed much over the years, but perhaps this man has. Perhaps he wasn't always so fat. Perhaps he had a beard or different colored hair. One thing is clear: he looked afraid when he saw me. So he has probably betrayed the Brotherhood. He probably thinks I'm following him so that I can kill him. Listen, Walter, I don't want to have to kill this man. Please tell me nothing about him. If I discover that he has betrayed the Brotherhood, I'll have to act.